So we've been having a really vibrant discussion about the use of these uh, checkpoint inhibitors uh, to treat many important cancers. But it could be, be argued that the most important cancer with the greatest impact on our society is non-small cell lung cancer, uh, the most common cause of cancer death in the United States and around the world. And I, I, we're really lucky to have two of the world's leading experts in the management of non-small cell lung cancer here, Dr. Mark Sosinski and Dr. Roy Herbst. And uh, Dr. Sosinski, would you be able to give us some updates about how the checkpoint inhibitor revolution is affecting uh, the, the management of patients with lung cancer? Well, I, I think this is a story that's evolved over the past couple of years. Um, and at this meeting at the uh, current uh, ASCO uh, venue, there's going to be a lot more data. Most of that uh, is quite exciting. I, I think the theme that we see with multiple antibodies, either with uh, against PD or PDL, is that there's a consistent response rate. And the most impressive thing about these responses, which seem to harbor around 20 to 25 percent or so, is the durability of these sorts of responses. And, and uh, as we were saying, discussing the other tumors, I think that's probably the most impressive thing mm -hmm. about about this approach here. And so um, we uh, have seen mostly phase one data and beginning to see some encouraging combinatorial uh, sorts of studies. Uh, and we have a couple of phase three trials in lung cancer in the second line setting that have completed their accrual. Um, one of the things in terms of level setting this new paradigm in lung cancer is how does it compare with our standard therapies? I think we're all enthusiastic that this will move the bar for patients with uh, you know, the deadliest cancer. Uh, the issue is we have no controlled data yet, and, but we have trials that are completed that I think will address these sorts of um, issues. So, so, so I think it's uh, um, a very encouraging data set uh, with a number of different antibodies that have clear activity, durability of that activity, safety profiles, which I think is a concern in the lung cancer population. Our median age is 71. Most of our patients have a smoking history. Age and smoking leads to other comorbidities and, and stuff. And so we have to be sensitive about the toxicity issues, maybe not for monotherapy per se, but certainly as various combinations work their way into our disease, I, I think that that's a concern. So Roy, thank you very for that. It's great, Mark. Uh, you um, earlier have, we were talking about the um, the the potential for toxicity from combinations when Omar was discussing melanoma. And we were talking a little bit about the difference in the potential toxicity profiles of PDL1 and PD1 because uh, PDL1 obviously is more restricted in its in its targeting properties. Do you think that's going to matter as we move forward in terms of managing people with lung cancer? Well, it certainly could. You know, right now in the absence of data for randomized phase 3 trials, it's hard to compare the toxicity of targeting PD-L1 versus PD-1. Certainly the idea would be that if you target, as we heard earlier, if you target uh, PD-L1, you leave PD-L2 intact, uh, and it, it has a potential role in normal inflammation and, and in, in stemming the, side, the tide of some of the uh, toxicities we see, you know, the colitis and the immunitis and the, uh, the, the pneumonitis. Um, so th these are certainly things to think about. But right now, um, I think we're seeing around the, across the board efficacy of about 20% in unselected patients for all the different agents that we're studying uh, in lung cancer. And the key now is going to be how to identify that population that benefits most. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen with uh, the nivolumab studies, they've gone to phase three. Um, at least uh, for enrollment, there was not a biomarker required. So um, will those uh, studies uh, prove to be positive or not? I think we all wait eagerly for those, those results. Uh, some of the other agents have gone uh, uh, and spent a lot of effort uh, early on to develop biomarker strategies um, for the uh, Merck uh, compound in order to be enrolled in the phase three trial uh, of that agent versus uh, docetaxel chemotherapy. You, you must have uh, a positive biomarker. And then within the trial, there's stratification for higher low levels within that biomarker setting. Again, it's an, it's an imperfect biomarker. It's a dynamic one that can vary based on time of biopsy and, and where it's been uh, taken from, but at least it's something that's moving forward. And then I'm very excited about the PD-L1 uh, uh, mm -hmm. targeted agents. We just heard uh, about the agent that's having activity in bladder cancer, uh, but, but those agents are also moving to phase three, uh, the, the one from uh, Roche Genentech, and then, of course, the, the agent from uh, Metamune. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually have a large trial that will launch in the next few weeks a lung cancer master protocol, and in that protocol, 
um, what we're doing is we're selecting pac patients with lung cancer based on their genomic profile. These are refractory squamous cell lung cancer patients. Mm -hmm. But as you can imagine, there are just a limited number of biomarkers for which we have targeted agents right now. PI3 kinase, mm -hmm. fibroblast growth factor receptor, CMET, and for the 50% that do not have uh, a, a known biomarker, they're, they're going to be randomized to the metamune uh, PDL1 agent versus uh, a docetaxel chemotherapy. So lung cancer, the, the point I'm trying to make, this has really taken lung cancer uh, therapy by storm. Who would have thought five years ago I'd be sitting with you at a panel? <laughs> um, you know, um, I'm not a we, bad fellow. Wait a minute. No, but 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 you know, I've, uh, uh, we were together, you know, in yeah. Vail many years, yeah, and yeah, I used to yeah, hear yeah. your lectures on immunotherapy and think, wow, wouldn't this be great if we could we could study these agents in lung cancer? And mm -hmm. of course, all the vaccine trials, you know, have right. been mezzo mezzo, mostly negative. So here we now have, you know, such a, a, a wonderful insight. The thing that strikes me both in, in my, uh, my role as a clinician and researcher is that we're seeing amazing activity in, in 20 to 25 percent of the patients. Having treated many of these now, uh, uh, these patients myself, with all the different agents, in those patients who respond, the RAS mutated patients, the ones for whom we have no other therapies, the four or five full uh, time refractory uh, mm -hmm. patient, it's extraordinary. The responses are quick in many cases, sometimes delayed, durable, but the other 60, 70 percent, figuring out how to work with them. And you mentioned the combinations. I think the combination work in lung cancer might be even a little bit more challenging than the combinations in, in melanoma. Um, and I know this because uh, Mario Snow and Harriet Kluger, who work in melanoma in my group, you know that the trials are filtering down to the lung cancer setting. Patients are a bit older. They've got more comorbidities. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's an issue. And there'll be a learning curve, too, by the way, uh, Lou. As people, uh, as this gets out to the community, which will happen, for example, with the lung cancer master protocol, physicians are going to have to learn how to deal with these different types of toxicities than we normally tr uh, think about in lung cancer therapy. You know, what's, what's interesting is you were talking, I was considering the, this whole obvious desire to see combinations emerge because it's been our history in oncology that when we combine agents together, we see superior anti-cancer activity. But if you think about the, the checkpoint inhibitor approach, the Clearly, for a certain proportion of people, 20%, 25%, whatever the number is going to be, be it lung cancer or melanoma or anything, the, the checkpoint inhibitor itself is necessary and sufficient for a, a powerful, clinically relevant improvement in the person's life. Absolutely, That can, yeah. that can sometimes be curative. Right. That, and, that group doesn't need a combination. Right, exactly. Right? And so the... the, the